Venezuela's President Nicolás Maduro Moros received the United Nations Under Secretary for Humanitarian Affairs, Martin Griffiths. Kosovo authorities postponed for a month the reinforcement of the ban on Serbian documents and the license plates in its territory. Also, the United Nations Organization warned that humanity is on the brink of a nuclear catastrophe and is currently facing a highly dangerous level of danger at the conference on the Treaty of the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada, and these are the news. In Venezuela, President Nicolás Maduro Moros received the United Nations Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Martin Griffiths. Griffiths arrived in the country last Sunday on a working visit in order to collaborate with the national government and other partners in addressing the most pressing social needs. The head of the UN Humanitarian Services also visited the executive, the chief executive, to learn firsthand about the implementation of policies of comprehensive care for the most vulnerable population, in addition to strengthening technical assistance between the South American nation and the multilateral agency. Martin Griffith se reunió también en horas de la tarde con el presidente del Parlamento venezolano, el doctor Jorge Rodríguez, en el Palacio Federal Legislativo para repasar diversos temas de interés. Martin Griffith, secretario general adjunto de Asuntos Humanitarios de la Organización de Naciones Unidas. And the spiral of violence continues in Colombia. For a while, indigenous people were killed in this 58th massacre so far this year, 2022. At around 11.30 a.m. local time on Sunday, a group of armed men burst into a commercial establishment located in Barbacoas Municipality, Department of Nariño, killing four white indigenous people and injuring two others. According to the Institute for Development and Peace Studies, this will be the 58th massacre so far this year, 2022. In another similar incident, also in Nariño, but in the municipality of Tumaco, the indigenous leader Maria Veronica Pai Cabeza, who was six Six months pregnant and a member of the Piwambi Palangala Reservation of the Awa community was murdered. Bolivia's President Luis Arce received the Vice President elect of Colombia, Francia Marquez, at the Casa Grande del Pueblo, the headquarters of the nation's government. The President of Bolivia assured that the country embraces Francia Marquez with affection and friendship, while assuring that the winds from the south are blowing strongly and strengthening the great continent homeland. Marquez is expected to discuss with Luis Arce the government program to be developed by the administration of Colombia's president-elect, Gustavo Petro, and the challenges ahead. Prior to this meeting with the President of Bolivia, Francia Marquez, together with the Bolivian Vice President, David Choquehuanca, and the indigenous representatives paid tribute to the Pachamama in the Murillo Square in the city of La Paz. As a people, we have resisted in Colombia, although we have not reached this moment of holding office, of being a power for the people. It does not mean that we have not resisted as a people. Colombia is a country with too many social movements in resistance. Women resist, young people resist, the elderly resist, our grandfathers and grandmothers resist. And we resist together. We have had to deal with a policy of death, which in recent years has sworn barbarism in our country, pain and suffering. We had had to endure an absurd word that should never have been which has cost the lives of thousands of Colombian men and women. Teachers' unions in Panama discussed with basis the agreements reached on education at the single dialogue table with a view to ending the sector's strike. The teachers reportedly agreed with the Panamanian Ministry of Education the end of the strike and a gradual increase of 6% of the gross domestic product by the end of 2024. 
The Association of Educators of Veragüense stated that the decision could guarantee the return to classes as of from Tuesday, August the 2nd, with a restructured school year to conclude in December, and explained that the document must establish that no reprisals will be taken against the teachers, directors, supervisors, and other educational personnel that participated in the strike. In Brazil, the president of the federal Supreme Court, Luis Fux, called for peace ahead of the electoral campaign for the presidential elections in October. During his speech that opened the second semester of the year, the, he asked for the respect among adversaries and the civility in the debates. Fux underlined that the Constitution guarantees the freedom for everyone to demonstrate, but that these freedoms demand respect and responsibility towards others and towards the country. Without citing Bolsonaro or the admin forces, who lately have been so in doubts about the voting system, the judge affirmed that the electoral justice is open to all those who want to contribute positively and also praise the electronic ballot boxes, underlining that it's one of the most efficient, reliable, and modern systems in the world. Now we move on to other topics. According to official data released on Monday, the number of forest fires in the Brazilian Amazon increased by 8% in July compared to the same month last year. The National Space Research Institute satellites detected 5,373 fire outbreaks in the region last month compared to 4,977 in July 2021. Brazil registered record deforestation in the first half of the year with almost 4,000 square kilometers logged, the highest since the real-time deforestation detection system began keeping track in 2016. For right President Jair Bolsonaro, who will seek re-election in October's presidential election, is frequently criticized for his environmental policies. Official figures show that since he took office in January 2019, average annual deforestation in the Amazon has increased by 75% compared to the previous decade. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. Kosovo authorities decided to postpone for a month the application of the ban on Serbian documents and license plates in its territory after the tensions lived on Sunday night at two border points between the two countries. According to the communique issued by the government of Prime Minister Albin Kurdi, this decision conditions the removal of the barricades set up by the local Serbs in protest against the measure. They also point out that the decision was taken after a meeting with the U.S. Ambassador to Kosovo, Jeffrey Hovenir. On his part, the Serbian President, Aleksandr Vucic, is working to calm the situation and stress the request to international representatives to help Kosovo to abandon these measures. The head of the Serbian government office for Kosovo and Mithohia, Peter Pekcevic, said Monday that Serbia was ready to take part in European Union facilitated dialogues with Kosovo. Petkovic added that the Serbian delegation could be ready to travel to Brussels from talks even with a day's notice. His comments came after Kosovo's authorities early Monday moved to ease mounting ethnic tensions in the country by delaying a controversial order on vehicle license plates and identity cards. European Commission spokesperson Peter Stano said the EU was following developments very closely and with concern and that both parties had been invited to Brussels to sit down and talk in the framework of the EU facilitated dialogue. China's Army Eastern Theater Command reported on Monday that its troops are on high alert in the face of rising tensions with the United States over Taiwan.
The military body stressed that the forces will confront any invader and march to victory while conducting joint operations. The Asian Command also showed a video displaying the development and the deployment of missiles, fighters, and a large number of very sophisticated armaments. The Beijing Foreign Ministry said that it was keeping a close eye on the itinerary of U.S. legislator Nancy Pelosi after reiterating its rejection of the official visit to Taiwan. Meanwhile, the People's Liberation Army announced that it began this Monday a round of exercises in the Yellow Sea, which will last 14 days and which implies a ban in the Southern Sea after the United States announced that it will double operations in the territory. Foreign Ministry spokesperson Zhao Lijian told the press conference in Beijing on Monday that one China principle underpins peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait and that the United States should stop applying double standards on the Taiwan issue. The one China principle is what underpins peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. It is the United States that has constantly distorted and hollowed out the one China policy and made irresponsible remarks on the Taiwan question, creating tensions across the strait. The U.S. side lately has as it speaks on the Taiwan question and must not play the double standard game. And the U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's ongoing Asia tour has shown the U.S. continuing desire for global dominance and seeking competition and confrontation with China by seriously infringing upon China's national interests, said a Chinese expert on Monday. Released by the Pelosi's office, during her visit, Nancy Pelosi will stress the so-called U.S. commitment to U.S. allies and friends in this region. To discuss how to promote common interests and values, including human rights and democracy. This shows her visit is aiming, aimed at promoting U.S. interests in the region, especially aiming at getting support from regional countries for the so-called Indo-Pacific strategy, which is aimed at strengthening U.S. global hegemony and its competition with China. So, she will provoke this uh, trust among the region countries. Now we address other topics. Now to the Donetsk region in the Donbas, the Russian offensive to the north remains constant, liberating new towns day by day in the midst of intense fighting. A few days ago, Russian soldiers and the people's militiamen seized the town of Novo Lugansk. Our special envoy Alejandro Kirk visited the place. It's only about 40 miles northwest of Donetsk, but getting here is not easy. The fighting is still very close. We are now crossing the minefield. At the moment, we are crossing the minefield and we are in danger of an active artillery attack. Because Ukrainian soldiers may be watching us right now. In these newly liberated territories, there are no services and everything is lacking. At first, we stayed at home, but then we came to this bomb shelter because we have a small basement. In the building was blowing up the whole settlement. That I remembered every day of my life, and I didn't come out of that basement. At first, they brought some humanitarian aid, but only at the beginning. And then there was more help, and people asked, why didn't we leave? We say because we wanted to leave at home. Yes, that's why we didn't leave. Home is home. Here, you can only walk on designated roads. The courtyards of buildings and even children's playgrounds were mined by the retreating Ukrainians. There are also unexploded bombs. The cluster bombs contain these deadly nails. And we are here. This is our land. Here it was bad for us for eight years when they mistreated people. The only question they always had was, why don't you go away, go away, go away? Many people wanted to throw us out. In Ukraine, we have nobody. Nobody needs us there. So somehow with Ukraine, we didn't see our future. So we decided. We risk our lives. We decided to wait for liberation, and now I think our wish, as they say, will come true in the near future. This is the center of communal services converted by the Ukrainians into barracks with their respective fascist ornaments. The fighting ended here literally about four or five days ago. We have been in the mountains for a week. 
I mean, the Ukrainians have finally been driven out of this village. They were brutal here. They didn't want to surrender this area in any way, but they still had to retreat. They had to retreat, and now they keep retreating further. We haven't completely driven them out yet, but we have already come close to that. There are four, five or six divisions. There are still even mortars there. Yes, it is difficult to get there, so we'll take it all in stride. The hardest thing will be, I think, Artemis, because they are pretty dug in there. Alejandro Kirk, Telesur, Novo Lugansk. We thank our special envoy Alejandro Kirk from the Donbas region. Now we continue. The Ukrainian and Russian delegations monitor the first shipment of Ukrainian grain as it leaves the port of Odessa under a deal aimed at relieving a global food crisis. The vessel, carrying 26,000 tons of corn, left the port of Odessa on Monday under a landmark deal to lift Moscow's naval blockade in the Black Sea. The five-month halt of deliveries from war-torn Ukraine, one of the world's biggest grain exporters, has contributed to soaring food prices, hitting the world's poorest nations especially hard. Officials said the Razoni cargo ship was making its way through a specially clear corridor in the nine infested waters of the Black Sea. Guterres said he hoped it would be the first of many commercial ships to depart from Ukraine and that it will bring much needed stability and relief to global food security, especially in the most fragile humanitarian context. And we have more news coming up after a final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. The United Nations Organization opens the 10th review conference to the Treaty on Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. During the opening speech to the event, the Secretary General of the International Organization, Antonio Guterres, affirmed that the world is not out of a nuclear danger and called on the leaders of the nations to take into account the serious moment they are facing. Guterres also pointed out that competition is overtaking cooperation and that, in his opinion, mistrust has replaced dialogue. The UN Secretary General assured that the world is only one misunderstanding or miscalculation away from nuclear war and warned that a nuclear non-proliferation treaty is more necessary than ever. And make it fit for the world. We need the treaty of non-proliferation of nuclear weapons as much as ever. And that is why this review conference is so important. It's an opportunity to hammer out the measures that will help avoid certain disaster and to put humanity on a new path towards a world free of nuclear weapons. It is also a chance to strengthen this treaty and make it fit for the worrying world around us. In Palestine, at least 42 people were detained following an incursion by Israeli forces in multiple areas of the occupied West Bank. According to local media, the military raid camps, villages, towns and several neighborhoods in the West Bank on Monday morning. Palestinian sources said most of the arrests were focused on Hebron Governorate, where occupation forces arrested more than 25th Jews and 39 houses were raided as part of their military offensives in Ezion and Yehuda areas. Dozens of Palestinians protested in rejection of the hostile actions and what they considered to be human rights violations. The coalition supporting the president of Senegal claims victory in the Senegalese legislative elections. Some 7 million Senegalese were eligible to vote in the election, which passed without any major incidents. Aminata Touré, head of the presidential coalition's list and the former prime minister, claims to have won the vote in 30 of Senegal's 43 departments, a success contested by the opposition, who are describing it as a prefabricated majority. Tour, however, acknowledged her coalition had been defeated in the capital Dakar in Sunday's vote. The opposition was swift in rejecting Tour's claims. The single round of voting will decide the 165 seats of the single chamber parliament, currently controlled by the president's supporters for the next five years. Kenyan presidential candidate William Ruto campaigns in the Kiriaga County of the Mount Kenya region ahead of elections on August 9th. 
The helicopter lands in the middle of rice fields, heralding the arrival of presidential candidate Ruto, as he seeks votes from the densely populated, politically influential heartland of Mount Kenya. This is the sacred land of the Kikuyu, the largest ethnic group in the country. In a country traditionally marked by voting patterns tied to tribal identity, Mount Kenya has largely voted for Uhuru Kenyatta in the last two presidential elections. So we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesuri English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.